Oh, yeah. Well, hey, one more time, welcome to 3D. I want to also welcome all of you to join us online. Great to have you guys with us as well. We're really excited. Uh, we're launching a brand new series today entitled Paradoxical. It's a series that I've wanted to do for years, looking at these things that Jesus said to introduce principles that really bring life, real life, and yet we find them to be incredibly counterintuitive. In other words, that they're sort of, they go against what I would call conventional thinking, logic, wisdom, and, and, and it's really powerful when we realize that there's a way that everyday life operates for most of us in this world, and yet Jesus entered this world and said, you know, if you really want to find where the real life is, live this way. And he said a number of things, but what do we mean by paradoxical? It's, it's that whole idea that it's one thing, but it's opposite of that. It's counterintuitive. It's countercultural, if you will. It's sort of like, how many of you have ever been really lethargic, feeling sort of like run down? How many of you know the best thing for you to do at that point is exercise? Because you reap what you sow. If you're ever bloated, the last thing you think is, I want to ingest one more thing, but the best thing for you to do when you're bloated is to drink more water. And so it goes against the natural flow if that makes sense. And that's what Jesus introduced. And so there's so much about it uh, that we're really excited. We're going to launch into this series. It's going to go five weeks. It's going to be an incredible series. And I believe if we'll all engage with it and apply these principles, we're going to find ourselves experiencing life in a brand new way. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be productive and uh, incredibly life-giving. Well, I've said enough today. We have the incredible privilege. Some of you have met a great friend of ours, Shavian Breit, from South Africa. He and his wife, Anae, become friends of ours at least five years ago. We met for the first time in South Africa, connected immediately, been journeying with them, them with us. They were here uh, back when we launched and, and been here since. And just really, honestly, some of you are aware of this, trying to relocate and uh, become a part of 3D and what God's doing here. Well, there's been some visa challenges along the way. Any of you familiar with that kind of activity, whether it's for yourself or somebody at your company, who you work with, whatever it might be. So we're still praying for all of that to come through. Um, but the cool thing is, Shavian's with us this weekend, and so I just want to give you an opportunity to put your hands together and welcome Shavian as he comes to bring the first installment of this new series. Good morning. My on, good. You know, I've been actually traveling to this country for about 20 years, but nobody's given me such a hard time about my accent than I have on this trip. As a matter of fact, yesterday I walked into a coffee shop and a lady heard me speak and she immediately goes, you're from South Africa, right? I said, you're the first person ever to get that right. So I was in San Francisco, and I, I just walked down the road, and I, I spoke to a lady, and this is the only words I said to her. I said, could you please tell me where I can find an ATM? That's all I said. She looked me up and down, and she goes, we don't have Australian banks here. <laughs> to me, that's very paradoxical. <laughs> so it's great to, to share with you and uh, be part of what God is doing here at 3D and actually help in terms of the series of paradox. And as I, as I looked at paradox and I looked at the Bible, what does paradox mean? I literally came across this and it says that paradox comes from the Greek, a Greek word where para means to come alongside or it means, um, it could mean beyond, it can mean so many things. And the word doxa, which really, really translates in most of our Bibles to the word glory. So if we speak about doxa, the glory of God, and somebody that has the glory of God on him. It's really only a person that has aligned himself with the opinion and the thinking of God. And you can see somebody that walks in that. And therefore, a paradox is something that is just beyond our normal thinking and opinion. I heard the story of these two engineering students, one from Harvard and one from MIT, and uh, they were st standing in this courtyard arguing next to this flagpole. And a CU Boulder student walked by and said, well, what are you arguing about? And they said, well, 
we're figuring out how to measure the height of this flagpole. And the CU boulder says, well, that's easy. So he just took the pole out, laid it on the grass, took out his measuring tape, measured it out, and says, it's 10 feet and 6 inches. And he walked off. And the Harvard student looked at the MIT student and says, typical CU boulder student, right? We wanted height, and he gives us length. <laughs> that is a paradox. It's one thing, but it, it actually is something else. And Jesus was really brilliant when it came to these kind of things when, when he spoke. And he spoke in so many paradoxical statements. And, and I really want to kind of read to you a passage of Scripture that the Lord laid on my heart while I've been here and thinking about this. And it's a passage from John chapter 12 and verse 24 and 26. And it says this, Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies... It produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be, and my Father will honor the one who serves me. I love this paradoxical statement because Jesus immediately jumps in and he says, if you want to live, you need to die. Now, that's not a very popular message, I'm sure. Why? Because I don't think any of us is in a hurry to die, right? But somehow, in this paradox that Jesus was saying, because when we look at life, we look at the end of life as death. We don't see death as the beginning of life. And this is what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying that the beginning of life starts with death. Jesus was actually saying that our very usefulness, our fruitfulness is connected to how willing we are to, to lay down our lives and what that would mean for us. Just before Jesus actually said this, Jesus had another statement in John 10 verse 10, which we all really know, and it's this. He says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you may have life and have it in full. And see, you're kind of standing at this crossroads maybe in your life, where well, you have to make a decision. Where am I right now? Has something been stolen from me? Do I feel that life has got more trials and temptations and tests? Or do I really experience this life and this life that Jesus gave more abundantly? Actually, I loved it when Aaron sang that first song and it was just that one phrase, because of his death, we could live. See, did we get that when we sang that? Something leap in your spirit when, when you said that. Because you see, that means that you have more associated yourself with life in Christ than life with these tests and trials and tribulations. There was a story, I actually saw this while I was here in the United States at one time. And so I remember this article, and I want to read to you an article that I kind of found very cool. And it was this, I want to read it to you as the article was published. It says, Chippy the parakeet never saw it coming. One second he was peacefully perched in his cage, and the next he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. See, the problems began when Chippy's owner decided to clean Chippy's cage with a vacuum cleaner. She removed the attachment from the end of the hose and stuck it in the cage, and then the phone rang, and she turned to pick it up, barely said hello, when Chippy got sucked up. The bird owner gasped, put down the phone, turned off the vacuum, opened the bag, and there was Chippy. Still alive, but stunned. And since the bird was covered with dust and soot, she grabbed him and raced to the bathroom, turned on the faucet, and held Chippy under the running water. Then, realizing that Chippy was choked and shivering, she did what any compassionate bird owner would do. She reached for the hairdryer and blasted poor Chippy with the hot air. Poor Chippy never knew what hit him. A few days after the trauma... The reporter who had initially written about the event contacted Chippy's owner to see how the bird was recovering. Well, she replied, Chippy doesn't sing anymore. He just sits there and stares. And it's not, to see why, it's not hard to see why, he wrote, because he was sucked in, washed up, and blown over. And that's, the, that's enough to steal the song out of even the toughest heart. Here's the question. Do you still have a song in your heart? Or do you feel that you have been sucked on, washed up, and blown over? 
It's like these trials, these things. Yeah, you, you, you desire something else, but you kind of feel that you're there and you're never experiencing this real life that, that God wants to give and that God can give. And see, there's only one of two things that you could really do when these trials and tests come. First is you can become like Chippy. You can become like this real bitter person. And really, that should be the normal thing because that's how people respond naturally to having problems. We become bitter to, towards other people. We become bitter towards situations. And sometimes, even as Christians, while we're in a test, we, we become so full of ourselves that, that God can't really move because so many times we're in the way and our fears and our hurts take precedence over this life that God wants to bring and God wants to give. Or you can choose the opposite, and that is to absolutely always just have a song in your heart. And it's as simple as making a choice. And I want to speak through some of those choices today because I remember in the Bible there's a story of these two people, Paul and Barnabas. If you remember Paul, he was one of the people that persecuted the church, persecuted the Christians. He liked to throw Christians in jail, and then he became one, and then he was thrown in jail. How paradoxical is that? And I don't know, but every time I saw the story of Paul and Barnabas and Silas, whenever they were in prison, they had a song in their heart. See, they had a different picture. They, they knew, they, they, they came to a point where they understood something about God's economy that death comes before resurrection. Death comes before resurrection. See, there's something I love about the Christian seasons. The Christian seasons have always intrigued me. You see, Christian season for me starts about the 25th of December because then we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. We celebrate that Jesus came into this earth. Some time passes and then we celebrate the Passover or the death of Jesus Christ. And then three days later, we celebrate the... Not everybody at the same time. <laughs> the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And you know what? So many Christians kind of end there. And I don't understand why, because I hear this kind of language. You know, yes, I've been crucified with Christ. I'm living this resurrected life. I have rose with Jesus. But see, Jesus actually went on and did something else. He actually ascended and is seated at the right hand of the Father. And then he goes on and he reads in Ephesians 2, 6, he says, But don't you know that you also are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms? We need to live this ascension life because that kind of gives us a different perspective. Because while we're still here, maybe we're sitting here in our trials and our temptations. And so many times, that's how we pray. We pray out of our temptations. We pray to God from this position of all these things that we're going through. And we're looking and, and we're saying to God, come on, God, nobody loves me. Everybody hates me. I'm going to eat some worms, you know that kind of. Or have you relocated yourself and you say, well, I'm living this resurrected life, this ascended life, where all of a sudden I'm seated in a different position. So when I look at life, when I look at my life, when I look at my trials, I'm not praying from out of them, I am praying to them. I am speaking to my problems because why? I'm seated at the right hand of Jesus. I'm hearing every thought Every opinion, every paradoxical statement, that goes beyond our natural thinking. You know, there are great scriptures, Isaiah 55, that says, where God says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. My ways are higher than your ways. God's not saying that to brag. God is saying that as an invitation to us to say, come and get my thoughts. Come and get the way that I think you should do life and how this life should look. But see, when it comes to what Jesus says, He says, lest the seed falls to the ground and dies, it cannot bear fruit. And see, so many times in our lives, there are, are different seeds that you and I maybe have not died to. There are seeds that we're holding on very tightly to, and we haven't really brought that part of our lives and planted it in Christ, in His death, in His resurrection, in His ascension, because we're trying to hold on to these seeds and and spending time with the Lord, I just thought about this. And, and the first thing that I, I felt that there's still some things that, that I can die to, and I believe it's a, it's a message to us all that we can all die to, is the first thing is, is the seed of our priorities. How many priorities in your life are still taking precedence over the priorities of Christ? Working with a lot of students at one of our campuses in South Africa, I've always heard people, because we're speaking about these life-giving principles. Students are, are, are grappling with this thing about their priorities. I actually had two students come and sit in front of me, and they said to me, Pastor, 
If I give my life to Jesus today, do I have to stop smoking? I said, no, why would you want to do that? They said, look at me funny, he said, Pastor, if I give my life to Jesus today, do I have to stop drinking alcohol? I said, no, why do you want to do that? Yeah, they were a little confused. And then they said, Pastor, if I give my life to Jesus today, do I have to stop sleeping around with all these women? I said, no, why did you want to do that? They were confused. I said, you know why you're confused? I'm giving you a stupid answer because you're asking a stupid question. See, you're asking this question about priorities, about things I have to do. See, it's not about these things that I have to do. It's about actually having this Christ life in me. And when Christ comes and becomes the center, these things automatically change and you don't want to do things. See, you're asking a behavior question. And so many times, our behaviors reveals our priorities. And for me, it's these if only I statements. Would you say that with me? If only I, would you say that? If only I. See, my prayer tonight, today, this morning is that that truly would be the last time you actually utter those three words. Because how many times have you said those words in your life, right? If only I would have listened to my parents. <laughs> if only I would have studied harder. If only I would have done that instead of that. You see, we say that because there was a priority that was more important than something else. And see, God wants to come and give us this life, and He wants to come and show us what His priorities looks like. The sacrifice that, that He wants to come and, 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 well, the sacrifice we need to make sometimes in terms of our time and our energy and, and different things. And, and so many times we need to take our priorities and lay them down and say, God, what is your priority for my life? The second seed that I saw is, is the seed of your possessions. The seed of our possessions. I've realized that, I don't know, um, this is probably medically true, but they say the shortest nerve in the human body is the nerve that's connected to the wallet. Right? If you touch this, it's out. <laughs> you know, when we start speaking about money, oh, eh, right? And so many times, God is saying, do I really have all? If you, have, if you want life, I want it all. God is saying He wants these few dollars and these few rands. He wants these credit cards. I look at this photo of my family. God is saying, I want that too. So how many times have you said that to God? God, I really want you to do this in my life, but don't touch this. God, you can do all of this, but don't do that. God, I will serve you, but just don't relocate me. God, I'll serve you, but don't give me another job. God, I'll do this, but don't ask me to, to do this in the church. Because so many times we are so tied up into our possessions. And maybe God is saying there is something that you need to die to. There's a ministry I want to start here in America. I want to call it the look-up ministry. Because have you ever walked into your garage? Walk into your garage and just look up. You see all that stuff that you've stuck everywhere. I mean, here in, in America, they have this thing, they call it a bicycle. In Africa, we call that a rural Mercedes-Benz. <laughs> How many times have I seen an African pastor with a bicycle going from village to village, just sharing the gospel, and you're just sticking it up there? And we don't think about these things, but so many times when, when a push comes to shove and God says, let me have all of your possessions. We kind of started holding on to that. And we said, all right, God, I'm going to give you everything, but this seed, I'm going to hold on to this one. I'm not willing to die yet. I'm not willing to give this up so that I can have this life and this life in abundance. And the next one I saw is the seed of your personality. The seed of your personality. So, a little while ago, I had some pastors from Canada actually come out to South Africa, and they wanted to go on a safari. So um, I took them on a safari to the same game park that uh, Keith's been to and Wyatt and Courtney have been to. And um, so we were driving around, and I don't know, it was just funny. We didn't see much. And so we spent a few days in the park, and we didn't see too much. And uh, this morning, we drove out of the park. And as we drove out, we can kind of see in the distance, we kind of saw the gate, so we know we were, we were close. And as we were approaching the gate, the next minute, an impala 
runs just right across the road, right in front of our car. We almost hit it, so we hit, we hit the brakes, and this Impala was running as fast as he can, and the next minute, a pack of wild dogs came out of the bush running after this Impala. And we stopped because we were going to see a kill. That's why you come to Africa, right? You want to see the kill. And we were going to see it, and we followed this pack of wild dogs. And this is incredible because there's only about 450 wild dogs left in South Africa. And we were going to see this thing, and we saw how these wild dogs flanked this impala, pushed this impala against this fence, and killed it. Because you know wild dogs don't eat their prey dead. They eat it alive. So they kind of bite chunks out of it while it's still alive. And so they killed this thing right next to the fence, and we just sat there watching it. And the next minute, they actually saw one of the females go over and she went and go picked up the pups. And here comes these little puppies, wild dogs with their cute little ears coming across to come and feed on this carcass. It was just the best sight. See those little blood stains on their fur? Uh, so just me that likes that kind of stuff. I don't know. And it was so incredible. And we were like, wow, how often are you going to see this? So I decided... I'm going to take a photo. I'm going to take a selfie. I wanted to be in this picture to say, look, look at the puppies. Did you want to see the photo? I want to show you the photo. Let me show you the photo. <laughs> They're a great photo. Aren't those puppies cute? <laughs> see, sometimes we have a story, or God has a story. And God wants to do a story in your life. The problem is we're too big in the picture. We need to die to the seed of our own personalities. See, sometimes we still have our own ideas. Sometimes we, we try and tell God the way it should be. You know, I've had so many times people coming, especially in this time when the, um, the economic crisis hit. So many people in South Africa lost their jobs and so many people came and sat in my office just asking for prayer and say, pray with me about this job situation. And I really asked them the question and said, well, what happened? What did you do? What did you think? And pretty much, eventually, somebody could come in and say, well, you don't have to tell me your story. I'll tell you your story. Because see, each story kind of sounded the same. People were saying, listen, I lost my job. I said, well, what's the first thing you did? I said, I thought to myself, how am I going to break this news to my family tonight? I said, what did you do then? He says, no, I remember it. Some guy said to me, if, if you ever want work, call me. I have a lot of work for you. So I, I thought, I'm going to call this guy. But I know if I'm going to call this guy, he's going to say, send me your resume. So, well, let me quickly update my resume before I send it to him. Well, if I'm going to update my resume, why don't I just send it to a bunch of people? I go, why did you do all of that? He says, now to soften the blow tonight when I tell my family. At least I've done something. I said, what did you do then? He says, then I prayed. I said, well, why didn't we just start there? You see, so many times, we're too big in the picture. We're still trying to figure out things by ourselves instead of taking these to God. Instead of taking us to God. You see, there's a verse that should have been in the Bible, but it's not. I don't know if how many of you can remember this verse. It goes like this. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Isn't that the story of man? Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Man had this place of, of, of authority and a place where they heard God's voice. And man had a great fall. And then it says, all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. I actually found the king's horses and the king's men. As a matter of fact, we all drove past it when we came to church this morning. They're called Barnes & Noble. Because you see, at Barnes & Noble, you're going to find every self-help book known to man of man trying to fix man. And see, I'm not going to take my brand new BMW to a backyard mechanic or my brand new Mercedes-Benz to a backyard mechanic. I'll take BMW to BMW because they have the parts. They have the knowledge. I'm not taking Mercedes-Benz to a backyard mechanic. I'm taking it to Mercedes-Benz. So why would I try and find somebody else's opinion over my life if I can take myself to God, the one who made me, and get his opinion about what my life should be and should look like. So sometimes we, we, we need to take these things, we need to put these seeds in the ground. 
So how do we really find this real life? Because I've realized that life comes through death. See, our fruitfulness for God is tied to our willingness to surrender our lives. Now this morning, if I should have had an apple seed here this morning, and I ask you, what do we do with this apple seed if we plant it in the ground? What will happen? What do you expect if you plant an apple seed? You expect an apple tree, correct? See, that's how we think. We, we think if we take the seed, we'll plant it and we'll have an apple tree. See, when God looks at a seed, God does not see an apple tree. See, God sees a seed that becomes a plant that bears fruit, that bears seeds, that bears a plant, that bears fruit, that bears a seed. Do you get this? See, when God looks at your life, He's not only looking at something to give you some life. God is looking at a seed, and we see a tree. God looks at a seed, and He sees a forest. See, many of us, we're only looking for success in life where God actually wants to come bring you significance. God wants to give you this life of significance. God wants you to say, come and plant this and come and see how this life I will bring. I used to have this nine-year-old kid in my church. Every single Sunday before church, he comes and downloads all the jokes he heard that week on me. It was awesome. Some of them made my hair stand up, but this nine-year-old kid, I know, he just found love telling me jokes. And one day he came to me, he calls me uncle. He says to me, hey, uncle, you know why God made you? I said, I thought it was a joke. I said, no, tell me, why did God make me? He said, God made you because he didn't have one of you. Can I say that to you? You know why God made you? Because he didn't have one of you. So there's something so significant that only you can fulfill in this life. There's a unique seed that God wants to, to bring life to. And the minute you can take your life and bury it in Christ's life, then we're going to see the fruitfulness of what God wants to do. That's why Paul wrote this in Galatians 2.20. He says, I have been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered Himself up for me. Can you say that today? I have been crucified with Christ. I have planted myself in this ground and I'm starting to see the seed grow. See, also, life comes through an exchange. Life comes through an exchange. Life abundantly comes only when God is in control. It only comes when God is in control. And, and I don't know if you, what lens you, you put on when you read your Bible, but every time I read my Bible, it seems that God is in the exchange business. God says, though your sin be as red as scarlet, I want to come and make it as white as snow. Though your feet is in the miry clay, I want to pick you up, and I want to come and set you on a rock. And so many times we write these trials, these tests, right? And God's also given us a test, and I, I kind of seen God gives us the test, and then He also gives you the answers. It's like an open book test, right? God says, today I said before you life and death, and then He goes, choose life. It's like God has something in His heart that we need to have life and life abundant. And we will only find it if we find that life in Christ. We will only find life when we find it in Christ. And Christ wants to come and say, whatever it looks like right now, the situation, maybe you're sitting in guilt, there's shame, there's pain in your life. There's things that you go, well, if only I. God is saying, I can do something with that. If you would be willing to leave it there. Not many times people come down to the altar and I see and they say, Jesus, I leave my sin, I give you everything, and then when they turn around, they kind of hook it back up and take it with them. See, it's a true dying to self in Christ, where Christ says, come, let me do something else, something different in your life. And the last one is, life comes through service. Life comes through service. See, Christ bids us come and die so that there can be life. Life comes through service. And many times, and this is the question I have for you, many of us have answered the question, I know what I'm saved from, and I know what I'm saved to, but do I really know what I'm saved for? See, if we say we saved to, I mean, salvation, the whole idea of dying to self, dying 
to our old life and now taking on this Christ life, this word repentance, this word salvation uh, is really a great word where, where it literally means, if you ask somebody, it means that I've died and I'm now making a 180 degree turn and I'm walking in a different direction. That's true. Because so many times, it, it's a picture of a trapeze artist. Have you seen these guys in the circus? They kind of swing. See, they're holding on to something. They're holding on to this, this old life, these, these things that are taking them back, the things that are on this side instead of the life side. And what do they do? They let go. And that is a picture of salvation. You have to let go of your old life, of the life of sin, of the things that's holding you back. And you have to make a 180 degree turn. But see, salvation only becomes complete when it's also tied to something. We grab hold of something new. That's why Paul said, I'm, I'm only going to experience life if I take hold of that which Christ Jesus took hold of me for. And Christ is taking hold of something in our lives this morning at the beginning of a series where God is saying, if you want to experience this grand life, it's got to start by dying to something. Because when you understand that I've loosened myself, I've tied myself to something else, now the real life can begin. Now God can begin this, this show of showing us off. And God is saying that, that life comes through service. We're walking in the mall. I, I was with Keith in the mall, and I saw a picture of, of uh, what's his name? I forget her name again. Dr. Quinn, medicine woman. Jane Seymour. I saw a picture of Jane Seymour and I had the opportunity to meet Jane Seymour when she was in South Africa and she was speaking and she's doing all these things with, with AIDS orphans. And um, they asked her the question, a journalist asked the question and says, why do you do this? She says, it's a principle. Something my mother taught me. My mother said, if you ever think it's going bad with you, go and help somebody else. See, there's something that gets loosened in us when we help somebody else. When we serve somebody else. The Bible says it's more blessed to give than to receive. See, sometimes it's just loving somebody. It's giving them somebody. And what is it that you're giving them? You're giving them that life that you already have. You're giving them an expression of what you have found in Christ. That life, that love, that acceptance. And that is what you're giving somebody else. And when that comes, your life actually becomes bigger. Because now only not I'm experiencing greater love Somebody else is experiencing a reprieve in life. So this morning, my only question is, are you ready to die? Would you be willing to die to certain seeds in your life this morning? There could be others. But I believe this morning there are people that are too tied to their own personality, to their own priorities, to their own kind of personal belongings. You close your eyes with me. Thank you, Lord, as we seek after you. We kind of feel stuck. It's like we're just seated there, or it's stuck in our a life that we know that's subpar right now, Lord. And we want something bigger. We're trusting you for something bigger, Lord. And thank you for people that's just willing to stand up right now. And I want to pray for them. Every person standing, Lord, that's willing to say, here am I. I want to plant my life as a seed in you. I pray, Father, for them this morning that they would receive this life and this life abundantly, Lord, that you would come and take their situation, their priorities, their possessions, their personality, the things that's being tested, tried in life right now, and I'll pray, Lord, that you come and bring an exchange. Their old life for your new life. I pray, Father, for your grace. Just to settle upon them right now. Holy Spirit, won't you come? And show them, Lord, how you're changing the situation right now. Speak life into their situations right now. I pray, Father, for this life to come and may it be a life of abundance. A life of fruitfulness a life of significance, Lord. And, and may they not only see a singular fruit, but that they would see a forest of just blessing upon blessing so that they would have enough to bless others again and serve. And may this life be a grand life for them. I pray that 
In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Do you all want to stand with me? And in this next song, if you would just be willing to kind of just surrender, say, God, in this time, just speak to me. Reveal to me, Father, maybe not the things I want to lay down, but Father, show us this grand life. May we worship the giver of this grand life this morning in this way, in Jesus' name.